there's a mystery about how the world exists, which is that the image of the lamb, which is sacrificed before the foundation of the world. So this is an image you find in scripture. And it's very mysterious because we tend to think of the crucifixion only as a consequence of the fall. That is right. Adam died. And so Christ has to, has to fill that up. Like God has to fill that up. So, so God comes in and then fills up death with himself. And so there's an extent, there's a re, there's a aspect of that, which is true, but there's also an aspect of it, which is more mysterious, which is that for something to exist, there has to be a sacrifice because there has to be compromise. There has to be, so you imagine like there has to be poked. So imagine like a pure form, you know, like a, like the Hindus think, talk about this cosmic egg that's there at the origin. It's like this pure form that has no multiplicity, that has no parts. It is just like this pure oneness. But that oneness has to be, something has to happen to it. It has to be broken somehow in order for the world to exist. And so that can be understood as sacrifice. Hello, everyone. Here you are at Tammy Peterson's podcast. Thank you for joining me today. Today I have uh, a very special guest. He's a very dear friend of both Jordan's and mine, uh, Jonathan Pajo. Jonathan has uh, agreed to speak to me on a number of occasions. I have a number of different podcasts devoted to the Holy Rosary of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Uh, I wanted to delve into the meaning behind the rosary and Jonathan agreed to talk with me. Now, if you don't know Jonathan Pajo, he's an artist, uh, a symbolic thinker, a YouTuber, the editor of the Orthodox Arts Journal, an expert icon carver of the Eastern Orthodox tradition. Uh, we talked today about the crucifixion. Uh, we have a couple of different conversations about that. This is the first one that we're going to launch. Easter is coming up and so we thought that this came at a good time. It's not like we planned it really, but we did choose which one we were going to release first and uh, so that's going to be today's um, conversation. I hope that it brings some uh, interesting thoughts for you and maybe some understanding to what it's all about because it's quite a mystery. Uh, the biblical stories are difficult to understand straight off and so Jonathan's going to give us some help. So here we are, we're going to continue speaking about the sorrowful mystery and we're getting to the last part of the mystery and um, this part is uh, about the crucifixion about carrying the cross and the crucifixion and uh, it is a complicated and delicate subject so I'm not going to say very much I don't think I'm going to let you talk about it if that's all right with you sure I mean <laughs> okay. it's it's difficult to talk about the crucifixion so hopefully if there's some things that you're curious about then you know I mean I think it's good that you you can ask um, and I also it's important to say that I definitely don't have I'm not going to pierce the mystery that's not I don't think that's really possible so we're kind of talking around something and uh, and I think that's okay because it's the crucifixion is probably one of the hardest things to understand I think in the world at least as someone who's interested in stories and someone who's interested in in history and all these things so it's difficult to it's difficult to wrap our head around what exactly is all of it, what's going on during the crucifixion. Um, I guess there's there's one, because of what we've been talking about and because of this understanding that I have now that uh, comes to me in different si situations based on how you interpret the biblical stories, I feel like I understand the crucifixion better because of the profound death and rebirth and ascension and so then I, I see those as a real top and a and a, a very a lo very low point and a very high point um, more uh, understandably but I would say that is the extent of my understanding so far <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, 
yeah and so the the crucifixion is obviously how can i say this it's the place the the maybe the best way to understand it at first is to understand it as a as the cross itself and so the cross itself is not arbitrary you know and it's funny because you hear people argue about whether the cross was actually an actual cross like that or whether it was just a post or something like that and, and you know people who talk up talk about it that way you're missing the entire point which is that the shape of the cross is actually part of the mystery it's part of the meaning which is that it's uh the cross is something like uh it's something like a cosmic shape it has everything in it because it has the middle it has the center and then it has a, a vertical which is let's say heaven is the best way to understand the vertical itself the verticality right and a ladder is is uh, is heaven and then it has a horizontal which is earth or which is the particular and so the cross is the place where the the invisibles and the the ladder of heaven meets the particulars and so in itself you know you know it's a it's an image of that but then it becomes more mysterious so you could just see it that way so when you just see a cross you understand it's basically a point of attention it's like everything is moving towards that it's the place where you are in space and then there's the four directions it's all of this type of of thinking basically you know even like i said even in terms of sp spatiality it's the it's the middle with the the directions it's all of that which is there in the symbolism of the cross but the mystery of it is why is it someone being killed that's the hardest part to understand um um and it of course it has to do with the idea that the existence of multiplicity in our world or the world of the fall the, the world of this death deadly body that we have is something that in, in the christian story is seen as a consequence of a fall seen as the consequence of of a compromise of a pride of all of these things which brings about which kind of leads into fragmentation and to to a fall um and then there's a pro there's a mystery which is that to return to the middle or to return to the center there's a there's a kind of death which needs to happen or or a consciousness of death or or a conscious death it's maybe the best way to understand it so you're you're a slave of death because of the fall that is you know we all have that experience we have we're pulled apart we're ripped apart by our thoughts by our desires by by the world right you're going to die where we're going to at some point our body's going to fall apart and we're going to die and so there's a sense in which the way to deal with that is is also to die and it's weird because it sounds so contradictory but once you once you kind of pierce that mystery you realize that it actually makes sense in a very basic way um something to do with medicine like take your medicine maybe is a good way to understand it the idea of the need to do something unpleasant consciously so that it doesn't happen to you unconsciously well people say you have to get to your lowest point before you get a new understanding and uh, i've experienced that i know that that can happen and it does happen daily that you come to difficult places and then if you can pause for a while you can see a redemption a tiny redemption in that you can get out of whatever difficulty you have at the moment I've and there's it. something about accepting the situation you're in, you know, and not, how can I say this, and not refusing it or denying it, that is also part of that, that salvation. So repentance, that's why there's a relationship between the idea of, of the cross or crucifixion, at least in our experience, and repentance, you know. Uh, and it happens intuitively in all kinds of weird ways. People will tell you, things like, you know, you have to repent to be saved and all that type of language, which sometimes might seem a bit superficial and arbitrary. Um, but there is a manner in which that's true in the way that you said, which is that if you have to recognize your state before any change can happen to you, you know, as you're, if you deny it, then, and then you have to embrace a dying, but it's not, it's not exactly the same kind of dying. It's usually a dying which is which is binding you to that suffering because you know, we 
we, we suffer and then we're kind of, we identify with the suffering. We, we bind, we bind ourselves to our suffering. And usually that happens mostly here. It's your thoughts. It's not your body as much. Like your body is making you suffer, but your, your attachment to that suffering is happening up here and it's happening in your emotions and your, in your thoughts. Um, and so there's a manner in which embracing death is freeing yourself from death because you're, you no longer are a slave to that suffering, even though it's happening to you. I mean, it's not, doesn't mean that it's not going to happen. It's going to stop necessarily. Of course, there are images of healing. And I think your experience is one of those. Uh, and I remember when you described it to me the first time when I saw you a while ago, I guess in January, two years ago, or a year and a half ago, uh, you talked about this, yeah, exactly, kind of this, this opening up and letting things come to you, like letting the prayers enter you and, and not, not, not crisping yourself and, and, you know, just resisting the, resisting what was happening to us, which is usually one, a large part of our suffering. You know, it's funny because as a child, when you grow, when you're born into a family and the family, the parents have a way of uh, relating to each other and it's never perfect, it's always a process. And then the children uh, are subject to that and then they learn their own way of behaving based on what they're given. And then you grow up that way and you might have, uh, you might have had a, a mother that was uh, felt victimized and a, and a father who was absent, say, something like that. And so then maybe you feel sorry for your mother, um, but you take on, you can take on something to deal with that. Then you grow up in a way and you've got this way of uh, behaving that stops you from the surrender, that it, uh, the acceptance. And that's a very, well, I guess that's what going to church is for, is to find that surrender and acceptance because you know when you were young say you were till you were 13 you had a way of dealing with things that was kind of working or at least you thought it was working pretty well you know and then you leave your family at 13 or so and go out into your with your friends and negotiate relationships from then on and uh, those relationships have to be um, updated and in order to update you have to give up what you have. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, that takes some trust, right? It takes trust. Did you learn that at home when you were a child? Maybe not. So, mm -hmm. right, so it's so complicated to get to this place. Christ got to that place where he could totally surrender, which is uh, unbelievable. Yeah. And so, so you can see that in the so in the image of the cross, what you're seeing, even in the, 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 the form with his arms out, you know, and filling up the cross. So it's actually a, it really is a filling up of the world. And that's the way to understand it really in terms of theologically is that, so theologically we would say that, you know, in order for God to save something has to assume it. And so God enters, becomes man, and then dies and fills up death and transforms it into something else. It transforms it into glory, really, is the best way to understand it. Um, and so this, there's a relationship between death and glory, like even in the story. There's a sense in which, in the old, there's a, there's a, all these traditions would talk about how before the fall, Adam and Eve had garments of glory, and that when they fell, then they received garments of death, garments of skin. Um, but there's also a weird, mysterious thing, which in scripture, many places in scripture seems seem to hint at the fact that those two are related very intricately, that one is actually an aspect of the other, but just not fully assumed, you could say. So there are verses in scripture which talk about how the, the, a, a, an old person's white hair is their glory. That's a really beautiful image. That's a mm -hmm. very powerful image, because on the one hand, the white hair becomes like light, which is emanating from your head right you have light emanating from your head so it's very visually right but it's also that white hair is is death and and it's a way of dying basically and so there's an aspect there's an idea in which that's it it's like a way of dying gets transformed into uh into glory and it's funny because you 
we I say that and it's it might sound so arbitrary to some, but if you can think of examples in your life, you'll realize that, which is exactly like the, the person that gives themselves to others um, openly, not out of resentment, not out of, but you, you've met if maybe a few people in your life, if you're lucky, that have really lived in service of others and, and giving themselves to others. And when they're with others, they, they give themselves. And so they're, they're dying to themselves constantly without without resentment but that dying to themselves is them filling up the world you know and though those are the people that when they die you realize that their story has completely filled up all these other stories and now you know they're the person that that, that will receive great testimonies and people will say they changed my life that these all these things that they've done so all of a sudden that that death is actually filling its glory like that's what glory is. Like glory is this thing that moves out of you and shines out. And so, so there's a way in which Christ is revealing the, you know, the way in which the world actually exists, like the way in which community exists, the way in which our relationships are, are rich, let's say, is maybe the best way to understand it. So the more empty I can become, uh, in. That's the that's the idea. It's hard to accept. I mean, I don't want to do that most of the time, but I see it. Like I see the moments where I have, and I also see it in those that I know that have been the most luminous. You know, uh, those are the people that, in a way, are the most empty. But it's surprising because they they are also empty, but they also become very particular. It's not like it's a weird thing. It's as if there's this image in in uh, one of the books, one of my favorite books called The, the, the Life of Moses by St. Gregory of Nyssa, where, where Moses ascends the mountain to meet God. And as he's ascending the mountain, he's basically giving, uh, uh, giving up everything. Right? So he, he gives up his friends, he gives up his sandals, he gives up all the coverings that he, he has. Um, and so he enters into the divine glory, into the glory of God, then when he's there, he receives them all back in a way, but almost like in a pure form. So he receives the pattern of the tabernacle when he's in the glory of God. And St. Gregory talks about how in the pattern of the tabernacle is everything he gave up, like all these things that he, all his friends, all of this now is returned in this kind of architectural thing, which is also the church, which is, which is kind of this universal pattern that he receives. And so I think that that's the mystery too, is that when we empty ourselves, we actually find something which is truer to ourself. You know, that seed, you know, when Christ talks about selling the field to get the pearl or, you know, getting rid of all the externals to, 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 to get to the, to the kernel of what you are. See, when I was, before I was um, in a better understanding of being centered with my belief, uh, I had a tendency to do things for others, but then would feel empty, but not mm. in a good way, you know, not in a good way, because mm, maybe because I wanted to be thanked. And now I realize, well, no, no, it's not about that. It's not about being thanked. It's about seeing where it's necessary to do something and uh, knowing that that was meaningful and worthwhile. Um, but so for a long time, most of my life probably, I misunderstood what service was. Mm -hmm. I, it was difficult for me to understand that. And the stories of the Bible and the crucifixion are so hard to understand that it wasn't obvious to me how to change that or how to get better at it. Mm. Uh, it took, well... It took a community and uh, and a lot of people before me to um, help me to get a different understanding. And now I realize more what that is. And so I'm not as afraid now to go out and to be among many people because I know that there is an, a higher purpose there mm. and, and and that that's, that's enough to just have a higher purpose. I thought, I thought there was way more to it than that. Mm. And, and that's not, it's not saying that that isn't much, but 
it's easier to understand that now than it was before and it'll still be a big challenge but it, it, it's a challenge maybe now with a more clear purpose but to get to that I nearly died to get to that I, I, I don't want that for people I want them to be able to find what I have found in a sooner and in a uh, easier manner um, I heard a story about a woman last night she said that she was born with alcohol in her bottle. I mean, she said she was born and right from day one she was drunk. And mm. she was drunk every day till she was 25, 24, I think it was. And she said she was also, she was from a very, a very dysfunctional family where there were a lot of drug dealing and a lot of pimping and all of this stuff, you know, and her mother was an alcoholic. So she she had no chance really to be to begin with. And when mm. she was 24, she woke up one morning and she felt a burning light on her. And she woke up and she said, what's that? And the person that was with her said, it's the sun. And mm. she said, take that away. It's burning me. But then from then on, she was more conscious. She said it was that day that she felt the sun. Mm. It was the first day she'd felt the sun. And from then on, she started to recognize when she was taking advantage of people. And she had been taking advantage of people and of herself, right? She wasn't, she was homeless. She wasn't taking care of herself. Mm. But she's now well put together mm. and in the service of, of God. And I think, holy crow, um, what, a, what a moment. And what is that moment? These moments, they come to us. You know, I can remember being in university and being very depressed and being down on the uh, banks of a river in Ottawa and praying to God and someone walking by me and saying, God be with you. Mm. Just someone walked by me in the park. You know? Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. That, yeah. That, I think, I think anybody who is attentive to their lives uh, will see that. Yeah. That's how it's that's there. Often how things happen. Exactly. Yeah. Well, it's uh, staggering to me. These, uh, these well, it, it shakes us out of our materialism. It shakes us out of our our idea that the world is just kind of ambling along and that uh, these things don't matter, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And so, so but I mean, there are times when we cry out to God and nothing happens too. And so that's also a reality for a Yeah. Long. Well, I don't know how long I prayed before the guy walked by me. <laughs> yeah, Might have been exactly. months. Might have been Might months. Have been months, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Although squirrels had come to spend time with me and I thought, at that point, if I never have another relationship with a person, I will still have squirrels come to be with me, and that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. Oh, man. But that's getting oh. low. That was yeah. low. Yeah. And I still didn't understand it for years after that. I still didn't understand. I was kind of illiterate, I think, actually. Mm. <laughs> yeah, in terms of biblical understanding. And this is the mystery that's hard also for us to accept and it's hard for, it's hard to digest because there's a sense in which when you when you read in the church fathers there's a sense in which our suffering is in a way there to create opportunities for change like that's mm -hmm. actually what suffering is is for and so because it it puts you in a, a position of weakness Right. And, you know, because the, this is the problem we have is that when we're strong, then we've got it. And uh, and we don't we don't have the we most people, some people do. And it, it's not impossible, but most people don't have the capacity to change unless they have an obstacle force it, kind of pushing them or revealing something about themselves or, or you know, revealing some weakness that they have. Um, and so it's like, I, you know, I. I don't want to make light of people suffering, but that at least we can understand it in our own lives when it when we've seen it happen, you know. Or if we have families, you know, often there's someone in our family that suffers. Uh, I can remember my sister telling me she thought that I'd had a hard life, and then within uh, a few years of that, her husband left her, and you know. And I, when she said that to me, I thought everybody has their time of suffering. And uh, it'll, it'll, un it's going to come. The suffering. Yeah, no matter comes. what, it's coming. It's coming. <laughs> it's coming. No matter what. That is, it might. If it doesn't happen to you in a way that surprises people because they say you're too young or you're too, 
healthy or whatever, it's going to happen anyways when you're old and it happens to every single human being in the world. Uh, and so there, that's also part of one of the, the aspects of the idea of dying, you know, before you die, that is that if you learn to, to give up some of that, these things that we hold on to, then when death comes, then we won't hold on so much. Like we won't, we won't suffer. We'll suffer physically, but we won't suffer the impotence that dying comes with, you know. So I was reading about crucifixion and the holding, the being held by your hands and how you can't breathe mm -hmm. because you need, because it stretches all of your muscles, your diaphragm, your, you can't inhale because you need that freedom of muscular, uh, of, the, of your muscles, the movement of your muscles to breathe in and out. Oh, oh my God, that horrified me when I read that. Mm. Yeah, it's wow. like a, a running out of, of breath, basically, a slow, a slow yeah. breath. Yeah, painful. And, yeah. and that is at the center of that crucifix, where that's what's happening there. Yeah. Wow. And you can understand it as a descent, you know. So the, mm. the image, one of the images, the traditional image of, of Christ on the cross, like the, the, is you see Christ on the cross, and then at the bottom of the cross, you'll see a little mountain. It's not a mountain. It's a little bump, basically, but it's, it's supposed to represent a mountain. Uh, and then you'll see a skull. There's a cave, and there's, there's, a, there's a skull hidden in the cave. And usually there's blood coming down on the cross, which will start to will drip on the on the skull. Um, so that is what you're seeing happening. You're basically not, what you're seeing is this filling up of death that Christ is doing. You know, this idea that Christ, as he's dying, he's descending down into death, completely filling it up. And as he's filling it up from the, the, the lower part, he's also filling up the higher part. Because when he's on the cross, there's a sign on his head which says, Jesus Christ, King of the Jews. And it's meant to be ironic. Uh, but it's also written, it's written in several languages, which makes it so, but it's, it's like a double irony, which is, again, like the crown of thorns uh, that we talked about before. You know, it's actually revealing a truth about what's there, what's actually happening, you know, even though people think it's mocking. So when Christ dies, what happens is the veil of the temple is ripped. And that's those two things happening at the same time. The veil of the temple is equivalent to the top of the mountain of paradise. It's the summit of, of, of the space where God and man meet, you know, where Moses went up the mountain and saw God is the same as the, the priest going into the Holy of Holies and encountering the glory of God in the Holy of Holies. So ripping the veil is Christ going all the way into the Holy of Holies and going into death at the same time and joining them together, right? I talked about this idea of making death into glory and, and that's what's going on. So it's, it's not, it's a pretty astounding thing, which is happening uh, on the cross in the story itself. Like when you read it, what, what it, what it's referring to, let's say. It also says that the, the, the thieves, the thief that was first hung, they broke his legs when they took him down. But they didn't break Christ's legs. They pierced his side and water and blood flowed out. That, yeah. is that, that's what they mean? Is that, is that the filling up too? The, well, yes. And so the, the hymnography of the church and, and many of the church fathers, they interpret that as the birth. Two things. It's, the, it's a new creation, you could say. And so it's creation which is pouring out but it's also the creation of, it's relating to the creation of Eve, that it's, it's the birth of oh. the church mm -hmm. uh, because, the, because Eve was taken out of Christ's side. And so this water and blood, which is coming out of Christ, is something like the water of paradise, which is coming down into the world. If you think of the paradise as a mountain and the sources of water coming down into the world, the four rivers of paradise. And it's also the birth of the church. Um, and so... Mm -hmm. And it's a it's a mystery. I've talked about this recently. I don't forget where. I think on on um, on a Q and A where there's a mystery about how the world exists, which is that 
the the idea the, the image of the lamb which is sacrificed before the foundation of the world so this is an image you find in scripture and it's very mysterious because we tend to think of the crucifixion only as a consequence of the fall that is right adam died and so christ has to has to fill that up like god has to fill that up so so god comes in and then fills up death with himself and so there's an extent there's a re, there's a aspect of that which is true but there's also an aspect of it which is more mysterious which is that for something to exist there has to be a sacrifice because there has to be compromise there has to be so you imagine like there has to be poked so imagine like a pure form you know like a like the hindus think talk about this cosmic egg that's there at the origin it's like this pure form that has no multiplicity that has no parts that is just like this pure oneness but that oneness has to be something has to happen to it it has to be broken somehow in order for the world to exist and so that can be understood as sacrifice um mm-hmm. and so what's happening there on the cross is that it's like basically the creation of the world where out of Christ the world flows out but it 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 has to be like a poking wow i see yeah but More. that stuff is hard to think about it's hard to hmm. understand too hmm. oh that's fascinating i need to know more about that so <laughs> so i've started to read some poetry about the crucifix and i was reading uh george herbert he's from like 1600 mhm and uh he writes about the crucifix and john dunn he's from about 1600 I was told by some notable person recently to to read those and uh I'm going to be sent some of those um poems um there's so much to learn about the cruc- crucifix that it's uh I can see how someone could devote a lot of time to I don't know if there's any um is there someone who just spends their time around the crucifix all the time and I don't know I, but like I, I said we haven't even started like we haven't talked about the actual the the wood the cross the tree the nails there's so much to talk about like there's so much going on at the same time in this story that it's that it's difficult to uh to talk about uh you know why so why is it that Christ has to be fixed on the tree you know what is the relationship between Christ and the serpent on the tree because there's definitely a relationship going on there so because Christ said that he you know as the as Moses rose as Moses lifted up the bronze serpent in the desert so to the son of man was be lifted up and so in the story of the bronze serpent these serpents are 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 uh, biting people And so Moses makes one out of bronze, lifts it up on a pole, and now everybody who looks to that serpent is healed. And so Christ is the serpent, is that serpent. So he is the bronze serpent on the pole. Um and he's kind of a flip side of the serpent in the Garden of Eden in a way. Cuz serpents bite. Serpents, yes, but serpents are or, also or strangle. They're also related to death in the sense that they're not stable. you know they they move and they're in so many places at the same time they don't have uh there's an image in in um in scripture where Moses grabs the serpent by the tail when he grabs the serpent by the tail it becomes a staff so it moves from multiplicity variability uh change to solidity identity uh you know all of that verticality and then when he lets go then it turns back into a serpent so those are like two aspects of reality basically the tree and the waters or the tree and the change stability and and multiplicity all of that is related to this now christ on the cross is like both at the same time right so it's both christ it's a serpent on the cross but the serpent is also being fixed to the cross um in a way that it's just it, these categories will just blow like they just blow your mind because it's it's like this variability being fixed and by doing that it's healing so it's death again so death being raised up 
And because it's raised up in a certain manner, then it heals you from death. So it, it's it's like a it's like a, a a cure. It's like a it's like a cure for a, a poison, where you take some aspect of the poison, and then you make a cure out of it, and now you give meaning to it. And when you do, then it heals you from the actual poison. And so that has to do with this idea of dying, like true dying, or dying in a way that is conscious. So you take some aspect of death. You give it meaning, right? You raise it up so that it becomes meaningful. And then when that happens, it heals you from accidental dying, you could say. Well, that's part of, I think, maybe, maybe, it's part of being grateful for having cancer, for instance. Yeah. Right? It's great, great being grateful for the suffering that I went through to bring more understanding and uh, to bring me a grace, really to bring me closer to grace uh, every day uh, waking up and, or and wanting one say wanting to control something that you have mm -hmm. no control over and recognizing being coming aware that you're controlling and realizing that with by letting go of that control you have freedom now you have freedom and peace because now you're not obsessing about anything mm -hmm. But you have to accept it was necessary. You have to accept that that control was necessary to get you here, to get you here to this point where you can accept it. Mm. So maybe that's the bit of bringing uh, that um, incomplete or misunderstood behavior to the present from the past, seeing its worth seeing it's worth that it brought you here, even though it was a sin practically, maybe what you were doing may have been a mm. sin, then you get to this place and you can be grateful for it because now you can let it go and be something new. I don't know. No, you're, you, I think you're right. And I think that there's, a, there's really a mystery in, like there's a mystery in sin, you could say, which is that although sin is bad, you know, everybody agrees. Sin, what it also does is it creates an opportunity every time. Every time you lie. Like, let's say you're, you're talking to someone and then for some reason, I don't know, even to make yourself look good, you say something untrue. What it'll do to you is you'll feel, like if you're attentive to yourself, you'll feel that fall. And in that moment, you have an opportunity to change to be aware, to become conscious, to be conscious of your sin and to say, oh, I'm doing that. And it's like that when you realize that, oh, I'm doing that, then that's a not, that's really an opportunity to change. And so the, the, the difficulty is that often we sin without knowing, like we, we sin without realizing what we're doing. But if we sin and we become aware of it, then it's a, it's, yeah, it's a, it, it can be a, a gift in disguise. Not the sin, but the situation you fall in. So, I want to talk a little bit about uh, relation, uh, relationships, marriage, uh, and um, in order to have a marriage that works, there has to be a lot of um, surrender. And what I've learned, because I've been married for what, 32 years this year, and I've known my husband for like 32 years, oh, for, you know, 55 years, something like that. I've just known him forever, right? right. So it's, yeah. yeah, so I've just, he's just been around for a very, so we have quite a long relationship, and so we have had many experiences together. And we have a good relationship, Jordan and I. We try to get through our troubles. We we argue and get to the bottom of things often and repeatedly. And I just want to say something about... Um, this is a tricky thing to talk about, but anyway, I'm going to be... I'm just going to say what I have to say. We can edit it out if we have to. If we have to. <laughs> okay, okay. Okay, 
So in order to truly make love with your husband, in order for a woman to a, for a wife to make love with her husband, she has to be uh, willing to be vulnerable, say. You have to be vulnerable, truly vulnerable, you know, not just playing at it, truly vulnerable. And, and I think I'm pretty good at that. And I've practiced that. And, but now that I have this better understanding of my service to a higher good, then I can bring that into my relationship with my husband at that time and so so and, and I don't mean that just in terms of my relationship with my husband I mean that in terms of my relationship with with God mm -hmm. and so in that moment when I'm making love with my husband if I am in service to God it is a much more complete experience mm -hmm. that sounds true like i don't it know it sounds <laughs> true doesn't it yeah, but i but it was a it's an it's a process of learning and it seems to be very important something i didn't take seriously enough was my relationship to god in everything i do hmm. it makes everything better it's you know, it's not just my relationship with my husband or my relationship with myself or my relationship with my children. My relationship with, with God comes first. It comes first. And if it comes first, then it's right. Yeah. Oh, I just can't believe that. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's just. Yeah. Well, that's, that's the, that's the trick of, of our life is that it's, it's when we, the secondary goods of our life, you know, our relationships, you know, all the things that we have, they only become truly good when they're in the right order or else they become a, a slave master. They become a tyrant. They become all these things, you know? Yeah. yeah. And so it's the surprise of sacrifice in a way. It's the mm -hmm. surprise of, of, uh, yeah, it's, it's the surprise of giving up your desires in order to, find them again yeah but it's hard mm -hmm. to do man it's hard to do <laughs> so I'm, I'm i i think it's wonderful to hear you uh to talk about that and to to seem to be really discovering that like i find that very hard to do because i i'm willful and i have all these things i want to accomplish you know i have this plan i think you know, i have this vision of what i want to do and even if my vision I think that my vision is in service of God. Sometimes it's not, right? Sometimes it's like, it's in service of me. And so it's, it's, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, uh, it's constant reflection, right? It takes constant reflection. Well, not, co what? yeah, constant reflection. It does. It does. And I, or at least constant attention. Attention, maybe. constant yeah. attention. Yeah. And even when you have constant attention, you know, our self-will is very strong. And, and it has to be, I guess, or it wouldn't be. Yeah. So it's good that it is. It's mm. just it makes the challenges most extreme within us because it's between self-will and God's will, self-will and God's will. It's constant. It's mm. a constant... Uh, you keep having to surrender you keep having to let it go, to give it to God, because we are so mm, used to being the guys that are running the show, but we're not. Yeah. So we have to remind ourselves all the time. And the crucifix, people wear them, you know, they wear them on their, they put them on in their cars, they have them. They put the, have them in their pockets to remind them. Yeah, to remind That's, them. To remind them that they're not, that we aren't in control, that we're not running the show. And that it will be better that way. It'll turn out better that way. 
Mm. Or it'll turn out the way it's supposed to. It might not be better, but it'll, in the long run, it'll turn out the way it's supposed to. And sometimes that isn't, well, eventually that isn't good because we all yeah. die. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so and there's it, a way in which, there's a way in which when we give up control, we also, we also kind of rediscover the places that we have influence, which is a true influence. Uh, but hopefully then that becomes in service to the higher, the higher good instead of just sort of serving our own, our own desires. Mm -hmm. But I can imagine, I mean, I'm not a man, I'm a woman. So I've been reading Esther Harding and all about the moon. It's kind of fun to read Esther Harding. It's all about mythology and uh, moon phases and all mm -hmm. of the, all of the Greek gods and all of that. That's very fascinating stuff to read. I haven't read that kind of thing in years and years. Jordan decided I should read Esther Harding, so I've been reading it, and, and, and I've been enjoying it. He said, that, "I said, George, yesterday, what am you know? I like it, but I, I haven't figured out why I'm reading it yet." He said, "Oh, it'll inform your dreams." I said, "Oh, okay, <laughs> okay, it'll inform my dreams." It'll inform your dreams. Yeah. yeah, and then maybe I'll get some further understanding of what direction I should be mm. going in. But this this change of this change of being with God all the time is helping me to be a more uh, to be more on my side and to uh, share my needs and and be aware of my needs mm -hmm. and to be and not to hide them. Yeah, so. It, this is a different way to to live, and it's new for me. It hasn't been like this mm. for a very long time. Yeah. Uh, so, I'm very, I'm very grateful that I've had all this this experience, and this time with George, this year of hell, really, mm. a couple of years of hell. Um. <sighs> it leaves me speechless what it's done. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it's pretty, it's hard to imagine everything you two have been through. It's just hard to, it's hard to think about it. Like, it's so crazy. I've been through so many things now that it, that I'm not the same person I was. No. And I couldn't be. But I am, in some yeah. ways, more the person I was <laughs> mm. yeah. than I was before. I guess, like you said, we, uh, spend so much of our time in the world that we lose ourselves in it. Yeah, and I feel like I've regained myself and I'm hoping that when we go on tour, I can maintain that. Mm. I'll have to maintain it. I'll have to. I know now that it's life or death for me to maintain that. Mm. I know that that mm, forgetting who I am would put me in peril. In peril. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's good that you're aware of that. It's, you know, travel is, you know, there's a reason why we, we pray for people who travel because it's a, it's a dangerous place. Like it's a, traveling is dangerous for us because we, because it energizes us in a certain way, but it distracts us and it creates opportunities to forget, you know, to forget what's truly important because there's, everything is moving and everything is there. Yeah, it's and changing so, so much. Everything mm -hmm. is changing. And so your schedule is hard to keep, you know, you eat, it's hard to eat the right way. It's hard to, it's hard to keep a schedule for a prayer to do all the things that we tend to do. And so it's a, it's a challenge. Well, sure. I'll pray every morning as I do. And uh, I often meditate. Sometimes I meditate with Sam Harris. I still can't get over that. <laughs> I don't know what to say. Well, I don't do it all every day, but yeah. he was, and you know, he, I was walking, I was walking and I turned it on and he was talking about walking meditation. I thought that's good. I like to walk. And he was just talking about, you know, spreading, paying attention to your peripheral vision and noticing where you are in the whole uh, visual field that you have in front of you. And uh, that's kind of a, that's a meditative state, and it puts you where you are, very very centrally. Mm. So sometimes you just well, you can get that from anyone, though you really can. 
Uh, but I'll do that. I'll do that. Uh, George said he likes to do that when he drives. So he drives and he pays attention also to, mm. hopefully he's paying attention to the road, but he's also paying attention to the trees and how they come towards him. Yeah. Well, there's something just about, because we, we tend to move up here and then we're, we're kind of up here and we're not, we don't remember ourselves. And so I think that, you know, it, I think that remembering yourself is definitely useful. Just, yeah, just being aware that you're there, you know, no matter how you do it is definitely a good thing to do because you, you'll, you'll notice things about your thought patterns more when you're doing that. You notice things about how you're acting and how you're interacting with others. So, that's yeah, great. I think so. Yeah, I think so. So I'll continue to do that in my mornings. And I won't let Jordan talk to me until 9.15 in the morning. <laughs> That's hilarious. I know. We got in the sauna the other day, and he started talking. I said, Jordan, it's only 8 o'clock. And he goes, oh, is that the rule for the sauna too? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah. So I think I think we're I think we've probably done as much as we're going to do today. I think we are too. That's that's quite a subject. The crucifix. It it stretches your head. Yeah. No. It's very difficult to to to. It's very difficult to think about it because there's a, a lot of other stuff going on. Like, should we talk talk about it again? Should we talk about it again? Sure, we could. We maybe have to think about the elements that we missed. A little yes, bit. yes. Like you said, the the cross itself. Yeah, there's all these really interesting uh, tra traditions about what the cross is. Okay, um, I'll read about that. And so, and then, um, and you yeah. know, and that Mary well, is at the foot of the about, cross. Yeah, the mother. did we talk about the two thieves as well? I don't remember. No, we, we haven't about. talked about that. Yeah, either. so yeah, there's so much to talk about. So yeah, we could. Okay, we could. let's talk about that again. All right. All right, it's good to talk to you. Good to talk to you too. All right. See you next time. Bye.